What's something you discovered about a culture or religion that blew your mind? Some cultures your friends treat you on your birthday and other cultures you treat your friends on your birthday. An example would be paying for a birthday dinner with friends. How much which country you grew up in messes with your sense of scale. I was born and raised in Canada. Lived here all my life. We're the second largest country in the entire world by area, behind only Russia. When I went to visit some friends in Germany, we got talking about Canada and I mentioned how I went to university in a city that was only a 4 hour drive away from my childhood home. I commented that I liked it, because it was far enough away to have some independence, but still close enough I could drop by and visit my family on holidays or breaks. This caused them to laugh uproariously, much to my confusion. One of them eventually explained that a 4 hour drive would take you more than halfway across the entire country of Germany, and it was not what any of them would consider close. These same people, by the way, had a church just outside of their town that was over 800 years old and no one thought that was particularly remarkable. That's when I learned the difference between European and North American cultures. A European thinks a 100 km trip is far a North American thinks a 100 year old building is old. Temple culture in Taiwan, the people who run the temples and put on holiday performances for their respective gods are a community of lost boys and society's rejects. They have an unsavory reputation associated with petty crime and drug use. Each temple is basically a carny street gang with a folk religion theme. They take your real money in exchange for fake money, which you are supposed to burn. So your ancestors have money in the afterlife. Insert mandatory inflation joke. Sometimes the temples have rivalries, and brawls break out between devotees during religious festivals and competitions. Folk religion is alive, and well in Taiwan, but at the same time, people who take it seriously have a trailer trash image, so it's considered cringy to be too interested in it. Good upstanding citizens just burn incense, say a prayer to their ancestors, take pictures if it's a touristy temple, and leave. There's a Micronesian island where all the inhabitants are colorblind. They know when fruit is ripe by the smell. It just gave me a new understanding of how people see the world in the different pathways cultures take to solve the same problems. Chinese languages, Mandarin and Cantonese and other Chinese dialects are mutually unintelligible, but the written language is exactly the same. Two Chinese people speaking different dialects would have no idea what each other is saying, but they could communicate by writing. Not only is Jesus in the Quran, he is the most mentioned person in the Quran. If you count direct and indirect mentions, Islam teaches Jesus was a prophet and was a precursor to Muhammad. In other words, Jesus is a central figure in the Quran, and the Islamic faith not only believes in Jesus, but generally reveres him. So much stuff from Japan. I think if I had to pick one it was how seriously they take customer service there. Like, it's just night and day from literally anywhere else in the world I've been. At one point I needed to go visit a bank to get some cash and I asked the cashier at the store I was at where the nearest bank was. In most places in the world, if you got anything more than a shrug, it would be some vague directions. A really nice place might give you a map or an address for your phone and point out where you were going. In Japan, the cashier bowed, stepped out from behind the cash register, grabbed an umbrella, a typhoon was passing through, so it was pissing down rain at the time, and physically escorted me the 10 blocks between the store and the bank, holding the umbrella above my head the whole time, and getting absolutely drenched himself. I felt really bad about it, and tried several times to tell him that an address was fine. But he insisted he would walk me there. It was just a totally different mindset towards how to treat a customer or a guest. Honestly pretty humbling. Also the no tips thing threw me for a loop. Not that I didn't know about it. But I didn't know how seriously it was enforced. There was a point where I was running late for an important event. And had taken a cab to where I was going. I still remember the total cost 3481 yen. Since I was in a hurry, I grabbed 3500 yen. Hastily gave it to the driver, and dashed out the door. I make it about 10 meters away, and I suddenly hear, Sumimazen, a car cuisin, Sumimazen, excuse me, sir, excuse me, from behind me. I turn around, and the cabbie has gotten out of his cab, and dashed after me, just to hand me the 19 yen, about 19 cents, change that I'd left behind. 
I taught English in a middle school in South Korea, when I was roaming around in the hallways, I found that not only were the girls holding hands, some boys were holding hands as well, they were just friends, there weren't any homophobic cries or jokes being made, in North America, if that happened, you'd be automatically labeled gay. There's a culture somewhere where they don't have a word for left or right, but they will say things like my northern foot and my southern foot, and you grow up to always be aware of where your north is, whichever way you are standing, I find that amazing. Danish people leave their children outside of stores when they go shopping. Being from the USA, you would be arrested for that 100%. Immigrants have been in the past, probably more than I would ever have thought. Nordic people in general likes leaving their kids outside. I'm Swedish and it's very common to leave small children to nap outside even in winter. The general idea is that fresh air is good for you, so kids should be outside as much as possible. In some places you can see whole rows of baby carriages with sleeping babies parked outside kindergartens. How cheap life is in some parts of the world. My dad was asked to do a speech for the UN in India at one point, and brought myself and my mother along for the trip. The UN put us up in a six star hotel. First and only time I've ever been in one didn't even know they gave a 6 star prior to that trip. Anyways, we had a meeting with a UN rep who went over the pre-travel preparations, what vaccines we would need to get, what documents we would need to have, who to call, if something went wrong, so on and so forth. My dad asked if we should invest in a travel safe for our belongings, worried that things might get pilfered out of our room, at this. The UN rep just laughed and said, if you even make the accusation that something has gone missing from your room, the first thing that management will do is fire everyone who worked on that floor of the hotel. Whether they were anywhere near your room or not, there are literally thousands of people who want those jobs and the hotel could replace their entire staff in an afternoon. If they so desired, your staff will be fine. And he was right it was. You got a real sense being there that people, in particular workers, just weren't valued as much as they are in North America. Everyone was replaceable. It was a weird experience. In Germany there is a holiday in which, during the dead of night, a guy will get his friends together, take a thin, tall tree, strip it of its branches, decorate it, write the name of a romantic interest on it, then anonymously strap that tree to the house of said romantic interest. When I was first told about this, I thought my German instructors were exaggerating, but nope. The next day the city was filled with decorated trees, and I didn't hear anything that night. I still don't know how they did it so quietly. Some Hindu rituals involve slamming coconuts into the ground. I remember passing through a street in Chennai in a cab and all of a sudden like 50 people slamming coconuts into the ground at the same time. I can't wait to go back. Coming to Vancouver, Canada and learning, not only that I had to tip, but that the nicer the place, meaning the pricier the food, the higher the expected tip up to the standard 20%. I remember being new around 8 years ago, I went to a kinda nice restaurant downtown, and treated a few folks, left a 5% tip for service I thought, was bare minimum. The server came up to me as we were leaving she must have been having a bad day or something because she was literally on the verge of tears asking what she did wrong. I caved of course and gave her the missing 15% in cash. Still, that was bizarre. That a lot of Americans literally cannot get anywhere without a car and that getting your driver's license is as a result extremely vital for gaining any independence, which is why the car is so synonymous with the American meaning of freedom. I've talked to Americans for years and only recently thanks to not just bikes did I find out just how car centric American culture is. In Middle Eastern culture, complimenting someone's stuff may result in them giving it to you for example, if you were to tell someone, back quote nice watch, they might give it to you. I'm someone who tends to compliment a lot, with zero intention of it being given to me, nor do I expect to give my stuff to someone, if they compliment it. I have so much trouble wrapping my head around this one. I've been into Korean culture the past year because of drama. Here are some of the stuff I've read up on that kinda blew my mind. The concept of Korean age which is one or two years older than what they call international age. Koreans consider the time you spent in the womb as your first year of life and each Korean gains an additional year on the new year. Speech levels are everything in Korean and you are supposed to speak more formally to someone who's older than you. 
That's why when strangers meet one of the first things they ask each other is their age, so they know if they should speak formally to each other. There are only a limited number of surnames in Korea, because of the concept of clanship. Each name corresponds to a regional clan, and some names are rarer than others. Patrilineality, who your birth father is, is a big deal in Korea, because of this until 1997 it was illegal to marry someone with the same last name as you, if you had an uncommon last name, because that most probably meant you were from the same clan, and therefore your marriage was incestuous, exceptions were usually for people with very common surnames like Kim and Park. For this same reason Koreans also used to look down on double in-laws, X. Your sister marries a guy and, and then you marry that guy's brother, because it is also seen as incestuous. Patrilineality also extends to adoption, and having children out of wedlock, to this day many Koreans refuse to adopt, because there is a stigma around taking care of another person's child, and if they do adopt, they would prefer to adopt a girl, rather than a boy, because the boy would not be able to carry on the foster family's bloodline. This is why many more foreigners tend to adopt Korean orphans. Likewise, having a child out of wedlock and being a single mother are also frowned upon in Korea due to this culture. According to my grew up raised Mormon now complete atheist husband, after they die, assuming they lived a great Mormon led life, they get their own planet, as in, backward space, the final frontier. Head church dude in the temple, not the church building where everyone can go to, but another building called the temple, where only Mormons can go into, at some point will whisper to a woman, before or after getting married to a Mormon man, her back quote after death name, that only she and her husband know, and basically after she kicks the bucket, and is hanging around back quote heaven she will know her husband is really hers, when he calls her name the Mormon dude gave her, there's more. But basically the whole Mormon episode on South Park nails it. While watching it with my husband I would hear slash watch something, and look at my husband and he would just shake his head yes. Our internal visualization of time more or less follows the direction of writing. I'm from Brazil, and I can only speak for Brazil. But this feels online with the rest of Eurocentric culture. I mean that, when we talk about the past or the future, the trend to gesture from left to right which just so happens to be the way we write. I spent some time in Taiwan, where they used to write from top to bottom and sure enough, yesterday is literally translated as the day above, and tomorrow is translated as the day below. And it's more than just that. Think of timelines. Horizontal versus vertical. The whole internal visualization seems to be related to that. I would love some input from someone who speaks a language written from right to left. Because right now this theory feels like grasping at straws. But somehow kinda right. Please someone prove me wrong. I visited a friend in Donegal, Northern Ireland about 6 years ago. They showed me lots of different sites in my few days I visited. One evening we went to a local chip shop. We were sat in her car eating our food and a trailer being pulled by a car came up next to us. This trailer had a man and woman tied up on the back of it, covered in what looked like food and dirt. They were laughing, and seemed to be having quite a good time. Right behind the trailer, was a convoy of about 8 cars all beeping their horns and cheering. They went around the town, and then all drove off. I was super confused as tk what had just happened. My friend told me the man and woman in the trailer were probably soon to be newlyweds, that it's tradition for friends to go into their home unplanned and take them out, ties them up and throw things at them and parade them around the town. She actually seemed confused that I didn't have a similar tradition back home or that I had never seen anything so strange. In Sikhism, the turban is a symbol of total equality. Before Sikhism was the religion it is today, the turban was worn only by the wealthy upper classes. The person who started the Sikh religion donned the turban to show people that everyone is truly wealthy in spirit and that it is the duty of all people, rich or poor, to help one another. So the Sikh turban became a symbol of equality in humanity and as a sign that that person can be turned to for help.